You know, we have been traveling through the Gospel of Mark together for, for quite some time now. And this morning, we're coming to a section in the Gospel that, that many would say is central to the Gospel of Mark, kind of in at least two ways. Like the, the section that we're in today, it's, it's central in the sense of, well, spatially and ideologically, well, goodness gracious. <laughs> The ideas that it wants to purport are important. We're just going to say that. <laughs> Ideological. Okay, I'm not going there again. I, I thought I could do it. Well, do you know what I mean by that? That, it, that it's central in its ideas and it's central spatially. It's in the middle of the book. Where we are this morning at the end of chapter 10, it, it kind of picks up with a, a focus and a theme starting back in chapter 8 in verse 22, where Jesus heals a blind man. And today, at the end of our time together, we'll see that he'll do that once more. Next week, as we step into chapter 11, we'll see Jesus enter Jerusalem, riding in on a what, church? Do you know? Yeah. What Sunday is that? Rhymes with uh, Psalm. Palm Sunday. Yeah. We'll see that section begin next week where Jesus' final days before the cross and before the resurrection, his primary purpose for coming We'll begin to focus on that together as a church. But this section this morning, it's central to Mark's gospel. The ideas that it purports about who Jesus is. I mean, everything in the last couple chapters has to do with the full meaning of who Jesus is as the Messiah and what it means to truly follow him. Follow him as someone who's like apprenticing from him, learning from him being a disciple of his, a follower of Jesus. And maybe you've picked up on this, like as we've been going through the Gospel of Mark, that word follow, it's one of the primary ways that Mark describes what a lifestyle looks like for someone who's a disciple of Jesus. It's very active. It's not, it's not a passive thing. It indicates motion. Maybe you'll remember that Mark was a companion of who? Peter. Peter. And he wrote this gospel account for somewhat of a, a Roman audience, and it begins very, very... Well, it begins in a way that announces who Jesus is. One author put it this way, that the gospel of Mark is fast-moving and hard-hitting. That in rapid fire succession, Mark uses specific events from Jesus' life to prove to a Roman audience that he's the Christ, that he's the Son of God, that he served, suffered, and died, and rose again. The Gospel of Mark, perhaps you'll remember with me, it's very intentional. Mark's not giving us a full landscape of everything that happens in the life of Jesus, but very specific events specifically to those who weren't familiar with Judaism, didn't grow up in a Christian home, so to speak, those who were Roman more in their background, to give evidence, to prove, to show, to share who Jesus is. And this is what he shares over and over and over again throughout the book, that Jesus is the king, that Jesus is the Messiah, that Jesus is the Son of God. He's not just an interesting teacher with insightful stories, or he's not, he's not a pontificator of parables. He's not like a, another voice and culture on TikTok or Instagram, but he has authority. We've seen this evidence throughout the Gospel of Mark. And maybe you'll remember back to the, some of those early chapters, chapters four and five, where Jesus, he's on the water with his disciples, and the wind and the waves begin to kick up. And Jesus calms the storm. Like, that's a very sanitary Sunday school lesson, isn't it? Jesus, he calms the storm. And that day, when the disciples and those in the other boats were around Jesus, and they saw this squall come up upon the sea, and Jesus just merely speak to the waters, and they obeyed his voice, listen to me, it terrified them. 
It terrified them. You can read this back in chapter 4, verse 41, that it says the disciples were absolutely terrified, and they said, who is this man? That, that he speaks, and, and the wind and the waves, who in their minds, knowing Genesis, that only God could speak and that which is chaotic be brought into order. Who is this man? That, that danger would bow down to him. That he wakes up from his pillow, as the King James would say in Mark chapter 4, and at the word of his mouth, danger comes under his authority. Demons, disease, death, none of these things can stop Jesus. And just over the last couple chapters, this section that we're ending today, chapters 8, 9, and 10, there are so many different testaments, evidences, demonstrations, proofs of who Jesus is. And listen, what it actually means to follow him. I mean, in these last couple of chapters, before we step into chapter 11 and consider his ultimate purpose to come and to die and to rise again, remember what Peter said in Mark chapter 8. When Jesus was asking, hey, who do men say that I am? Now, who, who do you say that I am? And Peter said, you're the Christ. You're the Son of God. Peter, James, and John. You remember they were on that mountain with Jesus. And Jesus was transfigured before them. <laughs> Meaning who he really was was finally revealed. I love what David Guzik said about this. Maybe you'll remember this. He said, about the transfiguration, it wasn't a new miracle, but a temporary pause of an ongoing miracle. The real miracle was that Jesus, most of the time, could keep from displaying his glory. See, here's the point. Jesus, chapter 8, you're, you're the Christ, you're the Son of God. Chapter 9, the transfiguration, this is who he really is. It's pulling back the veil for a moment. But also in this section... Jesus gives some of the most detailed and descriptive language of what it looks like to really follow him. Remember what he said in chapter 8. I'll put it up on the screen. It says that when he had called people to himself with his disciples also, he says, whoever desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the Gospels will save it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his soul? Are you picking up on these themes? The identity of who Jesus is. It's crystal clear. He's the Son of God. He's the Messiah. He's the King. What's it look like to follow him? Well, in Mark chapter 9, the disciples are kind of discussing, well, who's the greatest in the kingdom? And Jesus shares this in Mark 9, 35. If anyone desires to be first, he shall be last and servant of all. Well, I see his identity. He's king. He's Messiah. He's the son of God. I see what my identity is like as a follower, as a disciple. I'm dying to myself. It's not about pushing forth my agenda, but coming to an alignment with his. And then Jesus he does something in this section, chapters 8, 9, and 10. He predicts what is to come, specifically about his life, that he's going to die and rise again. In chapter 8, in chapter 9, and we'll see today in chapter 10 that he shares exactly what's about to happen to him. Let me ask you a question. Who does this other than moms in our life, right? Well, here's what's going to happen. Like, who does this? Where Jesus says very clearly, boys, here's what's about to happen. Here's why I'm here. And this is what I want to share with you this morning. As we close out chapter 10 this morning, these massive themes, massive themes that, that Mark has been describing to primarily a Roman audience, he's, he's pulling out specific events in the life of Jesus to prove who he is and what it looks like to follow him, well, this morning, they'll culminate. That Jesus is the king. You're going to see this morning in Mark chapter 10 that Jesus seems like almost down to the very detail is going to give a prediction for the third time 
of what's about to happen to him as he goes to the cross and rises again. But also, what it looks like to truly follow him as an apprentice, as a disciple, as a, as a learner, as one who follows after Jesus. So, so let's jump in to verse 32, Mark chapter 10. If you're there, let me know by saying, Jesus is alive. Jesus is alive. You guys are awake and ready. I love it. Verse 32, and you can probably say the word idea a lot. We're not going to go there. Verse 32, they were now on the way up to Jerusalem, Mark writes. And look at what happens. And Jesus, Jesus was walking ahead of them. The disciples, they're filled with awe. And the people following behind him were overwhelmed with fear. This is interesting. If you were here last Sunday, or if you can read the verse before verse 32, you see Jesus with little children. You see Jesus kind of giving this kind of very open arms message and approach. And then in verse 32, the tone changes. The way Mark sets this up is a bit unique. He tells us that Jesus, his 12 disciples, and others are headed up to Jerusalem. Jesus has been in Galilee. He's going to cross over the Jordan River and the area of Jericho and make a 15-mile trek, a hike, up to Jerusalem. It's a difficult hike, steep road. And as Mark says, they're headed up to where, church? Where are they headed? Jerusalem. Up to. Well, why does he use that language? Well, for one reason, it's pretty simple. Jerusalem's about 2,500 square feet above sea level. Where Jesus was before, near the Dead Sea, was very much below sea level. Well, what's interesting in the Bible, when it measures in terms of direction, instead of using north and south and east and west, it measures topography. You walked in those days. So if you were located even north of Jerusalem, you would always say, let's go up to Jerusalem. One, because you're walking uphill. But also there was this concept, this idea, this mindset, that whenever you made your journey to Jerusalem, no matter where in the world you lived, you're always going up to. It carries this idea of prominence, preeminence. You're stepping up in the world, so to speak. And here's what Mark writes. They're headed up to Jerusalem. Now, it's near the Passover. Many people would have been heading there. Important time, important place. But look again with me at Jesus's, I don't know, his demeanor, his attitude, kind of the way Mark sets the atmosphere of this journey. It says when Jesus was with them, he's walking ahead of them. The disciples, it's like they're, they're in awe of this. And the other group that's traveling with them, they're overwhelmed with fear. Overwhelmed with fear. You know, my wife and I have six children. It's interesting how each six, each one of the six, is very individual. Same cereal in the morning, same routine, same kind of dynamic, but they all are very different. And I have one child who I won't name specifically, but I see this dynamic in them where he or she can be in a situation that may be uncertain, may be unclear, and just a sense of overwhelming fear can take over them. It's like, what's happening next? Even tears begin to stream down this individual's cheeks when, 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 when they don't know what's going to happen. And as a parent, you go, oh, it's going to be okay. But have you ever been in that, that place where you or one you love, you can see evidence of an overwhelming sense of fear? Now, to me, as I read this, I look at this and go, what's happening here? We just read about Jesus, like, bring the little kids to me. Don't keep them away from me. Now he's headed up to Jerusalem, and the disciples are just like, well, can you believe what's happening? Jesus, he's way ahead of them. Everyone in the crowd is, is almost like they're trembling with fear. Mark doesn't tell us 
why his disciples are standing there amazed and why the individuals who are traveling with them are so overwhelmed. But I guess the question is, does he really need to? I mean, tension has been building around Jesus and his public ministry. And Mark, you know, in the timeline that he writes, he doesn't give us all the events that have happened in Jesus' life. He doesn't tell us in this account that Jesus had just been with Martha, Mary, and a guy named Lazarus. And in John's gospel, it recounts for us that Jesus had just done something amazing. John 11 tells us that after four days of being in a tomb, Lazarus was dead, dead, dead. Like the way the King James puts it, Martha said, Lord, he stinketh. Like that's how, that's who he, that's where he was. And Jesus calls him out and he resurrects, comes back to life. And John tells us in his gospel, that's the tipping point. Like the religious leaders around Jesus had had enough. They now began to intentionally plot to kill him. And we know from John's gospel that Martha and Mary and Lazarus, after this miraculous event, that they were spending time with Jesus. Were they in that group? Right here as we're reading from from Mark's gospel, chapter 10. I don't know. But can you imagine the emotion, the energy, the anticipation of this journey? They're heading up to Jerusalem. Messiah mania, it's at a manic state at this point. It's at its peak. Jesus, he looks focused, dedicated, determined to get to Jerusalem. Disciples are amazed. The people are overwhelmed. Maybe Lazarus is walking right next to him. Martha was right. He does stinketh a little. You know, you know, I don't know. Like, what's happening in that scene? The religious leaders are plotting to kill Jesus, and he is headed right into the belly of the beast. He's headed to Jerusalem, where they all are. And you've got to wonder what the crowd is thinking. Is this it? Is this where the Messiah is going to instigate the revolution? He's going to declare both politically and and militarily that his intentions are to take over as the Messiah. What's going to happen? Look at verse 32. It says, taking the 12 disciples aside, Jesus once more began to describe everything that was about to happen to him. He said, listen, we're going up to Jerusalem where the son of man will be betrayed to the leading priests and the teachers of the religious law. They will sentence him to die and hand him over to the Romans. They will mock him, spit on him, flog him with a whip, and kill him. But after three days, he will rise again. I want to share something with you that really struck me as I read through this passage so many times this week. You know this about me, if we've spent any time together that I have this addiction, this challenge, this problem, this uh, addiction to alliteration, you know? It helps me remember things. But from this little passage, there's three things I want you to remember about Jesus that we're not going to spend a tremendous amount of time on, but they relate to these two massive themes that Mark is communicating in this section of his gospel. It's the dedication, the determination, and the distinction of Jesus. Say, what do you mean by that? Jesus isn't headed into Jerusalem as the leader of this gang, the Messiah posse, to overthrow Roman rule, to throw out hypocritical leaders. He's headed to Jerusalem to fulfill a need that extends far beyond that generation's need to every generation's greatest need a savior to deliver humanity for sin. And this is the third time in as many chapters in the Gospel of Mark that he says, I'm going to die, but I'm coming back. But this is the greatest amount of detail given here in Mark chapter 10 about what's about to happen. And three things I want you to take note of. The dedication, the determination, and the distinction of Jesus. You say, what do you mean? You know, in Isaiah's 
book, Isaiah chapter 50, verse 7, there, there's a prophecy given about Jesus, honestly about his demeanor of what it would be like for him to go to the cross. Isaiah says this, he says, speaking of Jesus, this is his, his mindset, I, I, I've set my face like a stone, determined to do his will. My hope is that when you read a passage like this in Mark chapter 10, you don't just breeze over it, but, but you see here the determination, the, the, the dedication of Jesus, and I'm hoping that it warms your heart. Say, what do you mean? Why would this warm my heart? That, that Jesus is so dedicated. The disciples are in awe, the crowd's trembling. Well, here's why. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2. Because of the joy awaiting him, he endured the cross, disregarding its shame. And now he's seated in the place of honor beside God's throne. Think of all the hostility he endured from sinful people. Then you won't become weary and give up. Jesus was dedicated and determined to go up to Jerusalem. Motivated by his love and obedience to his father, but also motivated by his love and commitment and dedication and determination for your heart and for mine. You know, I don't know if that I have a lot of current or modern examples to reference here, but a loved one being pursued by a lover, that's a theme that resonates throughout history. And Jesus, he blows away Prince Charming and Snow White in this scenario. Aurora and Philip, Superman and Lois Lane, or that last in the Mohicans line, I will find you, you know, that kind of mindset. Like, this is what I want to communicate to you. The dedication, the determination for Jesus to go to the cross, to rise again. Well, let me read it to you. I love this article I came across from Christianity.com that speaks about Jesus' dedication to us, especially this verse in Hebrews 12. What was the joy set before him. The joy which caused him to endure the cross was you. His love for you was his number one motivator when he went to the cross. Jesus knew without his sacrifice, no forgiveness would be available for your sins. And that was more than he could stand. For this reason, Jesus endured the cross to make a way to be in a relationship with you. Imagine his greatest joy is being with you. Allow this truth to settle in your heart and mind. Jesus went through the horrors of the cross for the joy of being able to redeem you, call you his very own. If there was ever a drop the mic moment, this is it. Mark says, Jesus is way ahead of the crowd. His stone, stony face, it gives this sense that he's determined, he's dedicated to get to Jerusalem. Why? Because God loves you. God cares for you so much that he gave his most precious relationship so that he could be in relationship with you. And Jesus' dedication and determination, it doesn't stop there on the road to Jerusalem. It extends to today. His arms are always open to you and to me. He cares for us. He is the one who pursues us. He's dedicated, determined to get to Jerusalem. Why? As he just told his disciples, I'm going there to give my life. I'm going there to pay the price. And here's my hope. I hope that Jesus' dedication and determination for you is something that actually changes you from the inside out. That you could know that you are not alone. That God has not forgotten about you. Look at what Jesus has done for you. The cross should always be for us that reminder, that testament, that line in the sand, that sense of finality that God's love for you and I never has to be doubted or questioned. Jesus, focused and determined, dedicated to go up to Jerusalem. Why? He told his disciples, it's there I'm going to die. 
It's there I'm going to rise again. And it was for that joy that was set before him. But I also want you to remember this. The distinction of who Jesus is. I think there is a vendetta that just seems to increasingly get more and more obvious in these last days that we live in to somewhat normalize Jesus, to just kind of see him as a a prophet or someone who even didn't even know what all was going on around him at the time when he was on earth and people were calling him the Messiah. There is this vendetta to put him on the same level as everyone else. He's not. Jesus didn't lose his life. No one took it away from him. He knew what was going to happen, down to the very detail. Again, other than moms, like, who else is like this, right? No one. Jesus is the Son of God. He's the King, the Messiah, the one who came to give his life. I like what Pastor Skip Heitzig says about this. He says, this is a planned event. It's not, oops, I'm really in trouble now. They're going to kill me. Oops, I got caught up in the Roman government machinery and I'm going to get myself crucified. Oops, I'm a victim of my own popularity. Baloney. It's a planned event. Revelation 13, he's the lamb who is slain before the foundations of the earth for God sent his son into the world. He's not a victim of anything. It was planned event long before the universe existed from the foundation of the earth. The dedication, the determination, the distinction of Jesus is amazing. Do the disciples get it? Well, look at what happens in verse 35. James and John, sons of Zebedee, who are also known as the the sons of thunder, after all this is happening, they, they, they came over and spoke to him and said, Teacher, they said, We want you to do us a favor. Well, what's your request, Jesus asked. They replied, when you sit on your glorious throne, we want to sit in places of honor next to you, one on your right and the other on your left. (laughs) Jesus is determined. He's dedicated. He's focused to get to Jerusalem. And and James and John think, hey, maybe this is a good time to ask him to do something for us. (laughs) I like the way the New King James puts it. The, the, the new way the New King James translates this is, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. They wanted the highest positions of honor in Jesus' kingdom. Sit on the right, sit on the left. Maybe they thought they had a chance, right? They're in Jesus' inner circle. Maybe Peter finally said enough awkward things to bump him down a rung. And they're like, okay, we've, we're finally there, right? Like, that's our, that's our spot. Now, on one hand, you've got to recognize something about these guys. They believed that Jesus would be glorified. Right after he tells them of his coming death, they talk to him about his coming glory. They believe in their Messiah, but but the context, the the timing, the content of their request is terrible. And I think they may have known this because in Matthew's gospel, he gives a little bit more detail. He actually says that their mama asked this question of Jesus for them as a favor. And that's a really, really bad prayer. Mom, could you pray this for me? Anything that I want, could you take it to Jesus? But instead of ridiculing them, what does he do? Look at verse 38. He kind of interviews them. He said to them, you don't know what you're asking. Are, Are you able to drink from the bitter cup of suffering that I'm about to drink? Are you able to be baptized with the baptism of suffering I must be baptized with. Jesus uses these two symbols of suffering and difficulty, a cup and a baptism. A cup would often symbolize God's wrath and baptism. It's not what happened to Jesus when he was baptized by his cousin and it was a magnificent moment. No, baptism in this metaphor, especially in the Old Testament, was a person being overwhelmed by suffering. He says, are you guys able to endure this? The cup of God's wrath? Being overwhelmed by suffering? Verse 39, look at their response. Oh, yes, they replied. We are able. And Jesus told them, You will indeed drink from my bitter cup and be baptized with my baptism of suffering. 
But I have no right to say who will sit on my right or my left. God has prepared those places for the ones he has chosen. Obviously, they're oblivious. But interestingly enough, both James and John, they, they would, in fact, do this. Perhaps you know this, but, but James was the, the first apostle to give his life for Jesus. And John was the last to die, but suffered much along the way. But the decision of who's on the left and right, that decision belongs to God the Father alone. And look at what the other ten disciples, look what they do. Verse 41. When the ten other disciples heard what J James and John had asked, they were indignant. I don't think they're upset, these ten, because of the, uh, the lack of sensitivity to Jesus. Like, how could you ask him that? Look at what he's going through. Look at his dedication, his look at his face is like a rock. Did you hear what he told us, what's waiting for him in Jerusalem? Betrayed? No, I don't think that's what's going on. Jesus has got a lot on his mind, right? Leave him alone. No, they're more like siblings than they are sensitive disciples. Say, what do you mean? Hey, that's my seat. He took my, they, what? I should have asked him first. That's what's happening here. So what happens? Verse 42, Jesus called them together. And he said, you know that the rulers in this world, well, they lord it over their people. And officials flaunt their authority over those under them. But among you, it'll be different. Whoever wants to be a leader among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first among you must be the slave of everyone else. Now listen, this isn't new information to these disciples. In Mark 9, Jesus had told them, hey, whoever desires to be first shall be last, but should be the servant of all. Remember, in this section that we're, we're learning today, the, the ideas of what it means to truly follow Jesus, this is what it looks like. Let me put it in a visual for you. This is it. Like it's an upside down leadership structure. That, that to be the greatest means you're the servant. It's about serving others. And Mark records kind of the apex of this entire gospel in the next verse. Let me put it for you up on the screen. Verse 45. If you get nothing out of the gospel of Mark, this is to what you should hang your hat upon of its purpose and what it teaches us about Jesus. Jesus says, For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve others and to give his life as a ransom for many. The secret to life's happiness is living as Jesus lived, to serve, not to be served. That flies in the face of most preachers on some kind of social media platform today. That the secret to life is living like Jesus. And how did Jesus live? He came to serve, not to be served. And he says, I came to give my life as a ransom. And now we think of that word immediately as like paying off someone, like a kidnapper or a terrorist, but it means to pay the price. Jesus' life was the price to purchase ours out of slavery to sin. His death sets us free. It's his life for our life. And, and now Mark closes out this chapter in a way like it started, like this theme of who Jesus is, the King, the Messiah, the Son of God. What does it look like to follow him? It looks like being one who serves. He, he closes out this section in the same way that it opened back in chapter 8, with a blind man receiving sight. And I want to submit to you that this account that we're about to read, I think it kind of encapsulates what it really means to be a disciple of Jesus. Mark writes for us there in verse 46 that they reached Jericho, and as Jesus and his disciples left town, a, a large crowd followed him. A blind beggar named Bartimaeus, son of Timaeus, was sitting beside the road. And when Bartimaeus heard that Jesus of Nazareth was nearby, he began to shout, Jesus, son of David, 
Have mercy on me. Be quiet, many of the people yelled at him, but, but he only shouted louder. Son of David, have mercy on me. And when Jesus heard him, he stopped and said, tell him to come here. So they called the blind man, cheer up, come. He's calling you. Why does Mark put this account right at the end of this chapter? I mean, we're about to step into a, a recounting of the primary reason Jesus has come. Chapter 11, from then on, it deals with that final week in the life and ministry of Jesus before he goes to the cross. But he chooses this account of Jesus engaging with this blind man. I want to submit to you that what we're about to read, it kind of encapsulates what it means and what it looks like to really be a disciple of Jesus. You see, Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem, and as he's traveling there, he would have encountered two cities by the name of Jericho, the old city ruins and a newly constructed city being built by Herod. Tens of thousands of people would have been making their way to Jerusalem for Passover. The scene would be chaotic. There would be those begging for food or for money, and those that would be sick from different kinds of ailments all around the people. Many different beggars would be there. And Mark singles out this guy, Bartimaeus, and he does something unique. He does something unique that we haven't seen, at least in Mark's gospel, any other time. He, he calls Jesus by a messianic title. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Everyone tries to quiet this guy down. And, and it's like Bartimaeus is basically saying this. Yay, look, it's the Jewish king. Into a crowd that's under Roman rule. That's why everyone's saying, listen, be quiet. Do you know what you're doing? You're saying there, there's the son of David going to Jerusalem, which used to be David's capital city. Jesus hears him. And instead of seeking to keep him quiet, man, do you pick up on this? Any other time in the Gospel of Mark where someone would kind of publicly try to bring attention to the fact that he was Messiah, Jesus would kind of quiet it. Now he's embracing it in front of a crowded, very public scene. Has Bartimaeus come to him? They said, cheer up, he's calling you. And I want you to pay attention to these last three verses. I really believe they encapsulate what it looks like to be a disciple. Verse 50, look at what Bartimaeus does. Bartimaeus, it says in verse 50, threw aside his coat, jumped up, and came to Jesus. Threw aside his coat. That would have been supremely important to a blind man. Your coat, by day, that was what he had to, to kind of cast out to collect food and money for individuals to give him whatever he needed to make it through the day. By, by night, that would have been his one possession to kind of keep him warm. Could have been his only possession. And when he heard, hey, Jesus, this guy Jesus, dedicated, determined, distinct, hey, he said, come here. So what does he do? He takes his one and only possession tosses it aside, expects something to happen from Jesus. Stands in great contrast to what we read last week about the rich man who wouldn't give up his possessions to follow God. And Jesus asks him a question. Same question he asked James and John. Look at verse 51. He says, what do you want me to do for you? And the blind man said, my rabbi, I want to see. He doesn't reply to Jesus with that title again, son of David, but a very personal expression of faith. Let me say this again, a very personal expression of faith. He, he kind of throws aside his coat his faith is settled securely in who Jesus is. And he says, I want to be able to see. James and John, they wanted a seat at the table. Bartimaeus, he wants to be able to see. Not about personal glory and gain, but he wants to follow Jesus. How do you know that? Look at verse 52. Jesus said to him, go, 
for your faith has healed you. And instantly the man could see, and instead of going, he follows Jesus down the road. He's instantly healed, and he instantly begins to follow Jesus. One author put it this way. Bartimaeus pictures discipleship. He recognized his inability. Man, I know who I am. Without him, I can't. That's who Bartimaeus is. Can I share something with you? That's the doorstep of salvation. Recognizing I have a need to be saved from myself, from my sin, to be forgiven, to be made whole. That's Bartimaeus. This author writes, he pictures discipleship clearly. He recognized his inability, and then he trusted Jesus the one to give him God's gracious mercy. And then when he could see, what does he do? He begins to simply follow Jesus. Follow Jesus. You see, this morning as we close, we're we're closing out this section of the Gospel of Mark. And do you see who Jesus is clearly? He's the dedicated one. He's determined. He's distinct. No one is like Jesus. No one, the king, the Messiah, the son of God, and the one who came to pay the price for your life and for mine. That's who Jesus is. And what Mark has been doing for these last handful of chapters is clearly describing who Jesus is. Peter said it, and you're the Christ, you're the son of God. He's on that mountain with Pete, James, and John, and that miracle of kind of holding back what he truly looks like, what he truly is, comes forth, and he's transfigured. Elijah and Moses are there on the mountain with him, representing the law and the prophets, and they all give testimony to who he is. Here in Mark chapter 10, as the dedicated, determined, the one who could say, here's exactly what's about to happen. I'm going to be betrayed going to be handed over to the Romans, crucified, but I'll rise again. Jesus is the king. He's the Messiah. He's the son of God. There is no one like him. Do you see clearly who Jesus is, Mark would say? But then also, do you see clearly what it means to truly follow him? What does it mean to follow him? Bartimaeus, man, everything, Jesus, it's yours. I'm coming to you. See, being a follower of Jesus is not an additive to your life. It's your identity in life. Because different seasons of life will come and attach themselves to your identity, your work, seasons of parenting and marriage, places where you live. But as a Christian, following Jesus becomes core to who you are. That code is gone, so to speak. And to be a disciple is to have your eyes open to who Jesus is, right? The the blind see, the lost found, the poor becoming rich. And to follow him, serving him, that's where life is ultimately lived to its fullest. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life. You know, Helen Keller, one of the most famous visually impaired people in history said, it is better to be blind than to have two good eyes and with your heart see nothing at all. And that's why Mark kind of puts this account at the very end of this section. to Say, listen, this is where life is lived to the fullest to have your eyes open to who Jesus is and to follow him. That's where life is lived to the fullest on this side of eternity, to have your eyes opened. And my heart and prayer is that our lives would be transformed by these truths as we simply follow, as we simply walk with Jesus.